Now it's time to listen to a presentation on infants' action, how they broaden their mind, examples from social perception, executive control, and the development of mathematics. So please welcome the Professor of Developmental Psychology, also manager of Uppsala Child and Baby Lab, Gustav Gliedebeck. Uh, I'm... Um I was sitting outside for lunch in the shade, having a great discussion with Linda Smith, and I started to really freeze and shake, and I just can't stop. So if I stand here doing like this, I don't know what happened, I just got stuck in a motor mode. Of... I started uh, my the PhD program as a PhD student 19 years ago, and that very same year, uh, a really nice paper came out, not by me, uh, called uh, action, or, uh, Travel Broadens the Mind. And it was a study by someone called Joe Campus, uh, who uh, described how locomotion, crawling and walking, really sort of changed the world of an infant. Um, and it was an influential paper for me. And I realize now that what I've been trying to do for the last 19 years is sort of just the same. So that's for why this title, Infant's Actions, brought in their mind. Because instead of looking at locomotion, I've been very interested in reaching and how reaching changes the mind of a child. So that's what I'm really going to talk about. And I'm going to give several different examples of how um, the cognitive system of a small infant is being influenced by being able to reach and manipulate objects. So it's going to be a really sort of chaotic presentation going in different directions, but the overarching theme is one of how the, the construction of cognition is based on action, and in this case, reaching. Uh, and I'm going to take three examples looking at action prediction, um, executive control, and uh, mathematics, and then I'm going to hope that I have the time to talk about some ERP data, about how all of this information is stored in the, in the mind. Let's see how that goes. So, action prediction. So this is a very example. I think Linda talked about this as well, that the, the, uh, the eyes of a young child is, is slow and attention takes time to reorient. So imagine following this ball, moving in this direction and suddenly making a shift in a new direction. This not being something that we know when it will happen. Uh, what will happen then is our eyes will continue in the same direction as the ball for a while, and then we'll make a saccade to sort of catch up with the ball. This is a sort of a basic study of just ocular motor reaction time. So we measure eye movements of babies, and this is a terribly busy graph. But what you can see here, this is age in months, uh, and these are individual babies. And my point here is really that th it takes a really long time for the kids to make a reactive saccade. So just keep tracking the object, even though it's not there. For at least 500 milliseconds, some kids take almost a, a second before they sort of redirect their gaze. So they're really, really slow. And here are infants on single try. It's, it's just, it takes an enormous amount of time for them to quickly readjust their gaze. So in order to stay on track when things happen, kids need to be able to predict. To actually look at the location when something happens, they need to have some sort of idea about what's going on. And this is something that we've been studying for a long time. So this is the first example that I'm going to talk about as an embodied process where actions are really important for this ability. So in this particular case, and this is work that I've done to a large degree with Terje Falkytter, who's down there at the end. This is Olga, who works in my lab. And this is a study we did many years ago where she picks up small objects and puts them in a bucket. And we just show this in a video, and we've done it in real world interactions as well, but here it's a video. And what happens is that when an adult looks at this, they look at the ball and make a saccade to the bucket before the ball is being put there. So an adult, at least visually, are able to identify the goal of the action or the end point of the action and look there ahead of time. And that is, again, an important thing in order to overcome that lag of the system and be able to attend to goals and, and events that are important. Now, what, there are two things that was kind of surprising and interesting in this study. In another condition, Olga was sitting still, and the balls moved on their own to the bucket. And in this case, adults don't make a saccade to the, to the end point or the goal, but rather they stay on the ball. Doesn't matter how many times we show this, 20, 30 times, people just stay on the ball. 
I think it's just a matter that they don't really see that end point as something meaningful in that case. It doesn't, it's not a goal. It's just a future continuation of an object, and we don't fixate that ahead of time. Now, this study also looked at infants, because that's my primary interest. And what we could see here is that 12-month-olds and later even 10-month-old babies uh, tend to do very much the same. So they look at the ball and just when it's, the ball is somewhere here, they fixate the bucket ahead of time. Younger kids don't do this. So six-month-olds, they, they're not able to predict the, the, the outcome of this event. We reasoned here, very prematurely at this point in time, that this had something to do with the infant's and the adult's own ability. So it turns out that 10 and 12 month olds are really good usually at putting stuff into other things. So if you put a child that are 10 months in front of small objects that they can grasp in a bucket, they're at it. This is a fun thing for a small child to do, and it's something that's sort of engaging them because it's something that they're developing at this point in time. Six month olds really don't do this. So we have suggested that maybe that's the experience of the child being able to perform an action allows them to understand someone else. And this was at the bloom of sort of the mirror neuron hype. And I still think that this is very much an important factor here. So the suggestion that we brought forward is that this, is, takes, this is requires to staying ahead of time at a very short time range. So they need to see the object and immediately understand where this is going in order to fixate the endpoint. And for that type, on a time scale like that, it is not very efficient to start to think about intentions and goals and motives of other people, but it's very good to have a system that sort of automatically assimilates what you have and extrapolates the future position of something. Uh, in this case, the mirror neuron system. And this is, again, correlational data is not very good to, to, uh, to sort of untangle if this is true or not, or if this is a reasonable suggestion. Over time, more evidence has been, been accumulated, and I think now there are about 50 different studies uh, showing at least a correlation between when a child or an adult are able to perform an action or lose an action ability, and the ability to predict that action. So here are some illustrations. For example, actions that very young kids, say six months of age, are good at, an individual six month old that is good at performing a certain action, say for example grasping. So a six month old that is good at that is also able to predict the goal of someone else grasping. Putting things in the mouth is something that all babies are really good at at six months. And when they're seeing someone put something in their mouth, they all follow the object and make a saccade to the mouth before that hand arrives there. So again, there is this commonality. We can go up to 12 months, see the same type of pattern with actions that the kids can do at that, that age, at 25 months. And in recent years, there's been a few studies from Zurich looking at elderly people, 85 and above, that start to lose motor abilities again. And as they deteriorate their motor performance, they also deteriorate their ability to make predictions and seeing other people's actions as goal-directed. So there seem actually to be this continuity over development between the ability to perform an action and understand other people performing the same actions. I use words like understand and goals in a very sort of fluffy manner, because when we talk about young babies, they don't understand that there is a goal but just, just operationalizing this saccade as understanding, or rather fixating on the future uh, end state of something they see. What we can do, so with babies it's hard to go beyond correlations, but with adults, we and others have used TMS in order to see if the motor system is really involved in making these predictions. So what we did, uh, a study in Italy where we positioned uh, TMS over the primary motor cortex area controlling the hand of the individual subject. And that we knew basically because we had people sit there and we had activated the TMS until we got a twitch of the hand. And then we know that that's uh, under there is the, where we're stimulating the hand motor cortex. And then we can do the same for the leg. And then we presented hands reaching for objects. And what we can see is that just as the hand started to reach, when we activated the TMS over the primary motor cortex area controlling the hand, the ability to make those predictive saccades were diminished. But not when we activated the leg area. Again, suggesting, at least in adults, that there is a very clear connection 
between the ability to perform an action and actually activate one's own motor plans for those actions, and that that is causally related in adults, at least, to being able to predict the goal of other people's actions. So thinking in terms of time, being able to stay on time and fixate things as they happen in real time requires this embodied heuristic where we sort of take our own action potentials, action plans, and use those to perceive the future. So this is sort of one example of an embodied process where manual actions become very important. We can see from a very early age, the only way pretty much that we can see that kids can predict actions is when they have these motor abilities themselves. It's not quite that simple when we move up at the age. So we did a study with nine-month-old babies in China and Sweden, for example. And in Sweden, and in China for that matter, there was one context where they saw someone eat bananas with a regular Swedish type of spoon, and uh, some other babies saw someone eat with chopsticks. And we went to China and did the same study there with Chinese and Swedish actors and all, all intermixed. And what we could see there is that being able to put one's hand in one's mouth was of course important, but on top of that, there was an importance of the cultural context. So babies in China were really good at predicting actions done with chopsticks, but they didn't really get that Swedish spoon and what that, what that was all about. Uh, and in Sweden, it was the opposite. So when they saw someone eat with chopsticks, they didn't make predictive saccades to the mouth. That cannot fully be explained by an embodied account. It doesn't have all, everything to do with motor plans, because the Chinese nine-month-olds are not able to eat with chopsticks. But it just shows again that the, over time, it's not just the, about hands and being able to perform actions, but the cultural context in which uh, a very young baby lives is also important for the, making these action predictions. We can also see other types of experience-dependent processes uh, where over time, if the same action is repeated many, many times, from around 10 months of age, kids are actually able to learn from that and make predictions. So there is learning from seeing um, at this time scale in infants for sure, and definitely in adults. But at that very first age, when the kids are first starting to make sense of the social world, it's really the actions that are needed in order to drive this ability. So that's one important thing about action prediction, to stay on time and look at things as they occur. Another thing that we found that is, I think, very fascinating is that this very much relates to learning. And I note down surprise here. Let me give you an example of what I mean. This is another study of bananas. I have way too many, I have no idea why. Uh, in this particular case, these two women are talking to each other about everyday boring events like school, I think. This is shown on, on a video screen and we're doing eye tracking uh, on, to babies watching this. So they're talking about life and one says that she's a bit hungry, so she takes up some bananas and starts to eat. The other one looks at this and says, I'm also hungry, can I have some? And of course you can have bananas, you know, so she, she feeds the other one with bananas. Uh, this looks weird, I know. Um, it looked completely reasonable to me, because I was just going into parental leave with my second child, and this is what we did at home, I thought. Uh, we asked the parents who were in this study, is this reasonable? And they all said yes. So. Um, Statistically significant, everyone said yes. Uh, but you know, this is an experiment. So we, we did, we compared the, so what I can say what happened here is that the kids that had been fed a lot predicted the spoon going across the table. And this is a more complicated action. There are two people, so they needed to be around 12 months old and have somewhere around 200 days of experience being fed in order to make these predictions. Now that sounds, how do we know that? Well. I don't know now when I started to feed my kids bananas, but, but when I had a one-year-old at home, I was pretty sure when I started that, because at least from a father perspective, everything was sort of you know, easy uh, before food was introduced, and then it was chaos. I'm sure my wife has a completely different perspective on that. Um, but they felt very certain about when they started to feed their child, and therefore we could calculate some sort of life experience, and there is a very strong correlation between the child's having seen, been part of this type of action and being able to understand other people again. 
But that wasn't my real point. I was talking about surprise. So the surprise here is that other condition. Two girls talking about school, being boring, one is hungry, eats bananas, the other one says, can I have some bananas? Sure. But we put the bananas on the back of her hand, and she leans forward and eats from the back of her hand. That is weird. That was weird at my home, and all the parents said that this is weird. So when we have what, about here, what happens is that the kids think the spoon is going to the, to the mouth, and when it doesn't, they become surprised. And we can see that, that their pupils dilate. So there's sort of almost like a shock. That pupil dilation is like, oh! that's what we're measuring. And we can go on with further experiments. I'm not going to talk about it too much here, but we can make controls and make sure see what is actually going on. And it's not that it's unfamiliar. Uh, it's that it's sort of violating some assumptions of rationality, sort of if you want to feed someone, why not just put it in the mouth? This is a really strange detour, why do that? Um, and, but anyway, we get that surprise, and we get that in very many different studies. Now, going back to this thing, those two things correlate strongly, even when they're in separate different tasks. So, so the kids that are good at making predictions are also good at being surprised. In the, independent of that, they're not the same actions. And what I think is happening here is that here we actually have a very low-level hypothesis testing system that doesn't require a lot of cognition, but it, it feeds on the ability to perform the action uh, and some assumptions about how actions are generally performed. So if I'm looking at a certain location, not only have I been able to predict that and fixate it when it happens, but I'm also by looking there, have an assumption about what's going to happen in the world. And if that is, turns out to be true, I'm being reinforced for that assumption. But if something else happened, like someone puts bananas on the back of someone's hand, hand, even though I'm looking at their mouth, that surprise reaction is an indicator that I'm wrong. That's an error signal. And that error signal can feed into sort of the starting of something like an internal model, where you can build an understanding of the world not by having a mental representation of other people's states and intentions, but just from rather from looking and making these informal predictions about the world. Why I'm talking about this is that this actually turns out to have consequences later in life. So if we measure this at six months, we can see that they correlate. We've done this in a sample of 120 babies, and we've done it in other samples as well, 60 and 80 babies. We can see that when they get older, Kids that are good at this hypothesis testing at six months actually develop better executive control abilities at 18 months. And in a completely different study, kids that have a lot of this at 10 months perform very particularly in a pro-social interaction task at two years of age. So in this task, the child is playing with toys with an adult. And then the adult goes over here and says, oh, time to clean up. Here's a bucket. Can you please hand me the toys so I can put it in the bucket? Okay, about half of the kids take the toys and put them directly in the bucket. That's good. But about half of the kids, the other half, they take the toys and give them to the person asking for the toys. These are all good strategies, but they're different strategies. And the kids that at six months are very good at this, have a much higher tendency to give something to someone who requests it. Now, we can say that these are all correlated. I'm, I'm only here emphasizing the, the correlations that sort of we expected. Of course, we're controlling for many other eye-tracking tasks and general development and other things. So in both of these studies, there seems to be sort of long-term consequences, or at least long-term associations, of this very early hypothesis testing system that, as I argue, is has been developed for the sole purpose of being on time, fueled by or bootstrapped by the own motor system. We're just in the sort of process of starting exploring this, so this is, these are really sort of preliminary ideas about what we're going to do in the future here. But sort of this low-level hypothesis testing is something that I find to be very interesting. As I said, I will just jump around in different things altogether. So let me move to the second part where early motor behavior and manual behavior is important for cognitive development. So 
I've been really interested in a while what executive control is all about. And this, I hear I'm absolutely not alone. There is a huge sort of surge in the infancy literature trying to understand the early foundations of executive control, because we all know that it's really good to have good executive control abilities. But what are the foundations? And if we know those foundations, what should we do to sort of uh, help the system develop these things better? Now, one thing that we thought of, this is extremely speculative. Okay. Here was a speculation we had a few years ago, and this is work done by Janna Gottwald, it's down there. Is that executive control is a lot about planning for the future. It's about regulating one's behavior with respect to future outcomes. What should I do in order to receive a goal in the future, or what should I absolutely not do in order to succeed at something in the future? There's two examples. That's classically being described as executive functions, here illustrated by the marshmallow test. There is no marshmallow test in this, because that's itself is, is, a, is a discussion, but just as an indicator. Now, what is action planning, actually? So when I'm, again, manipulating objects, moving things around, what I'm doing is that I'm planning for the future. If I want to grasp something, I can't just go, you know. I just need to do is, Increase my velocity, decrease just in time, move my fingers together just in time in order to get something. There's a lot of planning towards the future. There's a lot of selections of goals, and there's also a lot of inhibition about selecting one thing over another. So at a very superficial level, there are a lot of commonalities between action planning and executive control. But for some reason, these have always been described as separate parts. So we wanted to do a series of studies, which have started and the first one is published, uh, Jana wanted to, where we can see that is there actually a link between these two different functions or, or processes. And the argument is this, that if we look at the brain development early in life, in general, we can see that the networks that control different types of behaviors are widely distributed. And over time, they become specialized and, and localized. So if there is a system for controlling planning in the future, towards the future that involves both the motor cortex, the cerebellum, and start to interact with the prefrontal cortex, it's possible that that controls both of these things. And over time, interactive specialization will create two different subcomponents, one that is a classical prefrontal executive control function network, and another for motor control. But early in life, they might be blurred. And it might be the development of the action system that feeds into and kickstarts this system. It's an idea. So in order to test that, uh, Jana had babies, or they were 18 month olds actually, reach for objects. So in this case, there's an object here, the child sits here. Of course, it's never like this, but let's assume this is the perfect child just sitting still like this. Okay reaching, and we have markers on the hand indicating the velocity of, of the reach. Now, this is actually the typical velocity profile of a reach like this. What we're after is that very first movement the child makes. So there is acceleration and deceleration, several of these. And the more well-developed a reach is, the fewer of these uh, acceleration, deceleration phases are there. Basically, the better you are, the more smooth your reaching is. So what we want to look at is the peak velocity of the first movement unit. Because if that is fast, it means that it's a long first movement unit. That it's less jerky and more smooth. And that's what she did. So she had lots of babies come into the lab, and we measured their reaching and calculated this, this, this movement unit peak velocity. And then we had several executive control tasks. Uh, this is the reaching task. We had the magic wand of science, which uh, my kids completely failed when we tested it. And I guess I would as well if it was marshmallows. So this is a glittery wand that is fantastic. You just turn it and there's glitter flowing down. Put it in the front of the kids and say, don't touch it. Uh, and of course, not touching it is better than doing it, okay, in that case. And then we basically hide something in a drawer and spin it around and get the kids to search for it. And then there's a complex inhibition task where they need to pull a knob in order to get something. 
And we saw, tried to see if there is uh, an association here between these different variables. So here you have the, the peak velocity of that movement unit and a higher value is better. And what we can see that this relates very strongly to working memory and to simple inhibition. This is terribly skewed, but when we uh, transform it, it still works. So at least for, not for complex inhibition at this age, at 18 months, but for the simpler executive control tasks, that, that the, how they perform in their reaching action in the very first 200 milliseconds, it's clearly indicative of their sort of longer term planning. And why inhibition is important, because this inquires not to move. So it's not simply that some kids are better at reaching and therefore they're better at executive control, but there's a fundamental <laughs> planning ability that goes into both. And what we argue is one common network involved in controlling actions over time. Third example. So these are the, why I take these examples is, I guess, because I've done the studies with collaborators, but also because they sort of point to different ways in which action helps shape the mind. So first, we talked about mirroring and simulation. The second was about networks in the brain overlapping. But the third example comes very close to what Linda was talking about, where, where looking at objects make you learn about objects. And in this case, instead, I was talking about acting on objects make you learn about objects. But in reality, these two perspectives are very integrated. I measure reaching and Linda measured looking, but it's an action perception system, right? So we're just different, measuring different dimensions, I think at least. You can say what you think later, but. So going back again, this is work uh, Elin and Marcus and me have been doing. So this magic moment when babies start to reach, what, you know, it's not a binary, but just assume it's a, it's a, that babies first don't reach and all of a sudden they do. What they can do is that they can start to manipulate their world. It's quite a fantastic thing. I mean, a newborn baby can manipulate their world. You know, they just need to scream and the world has been manipulated very clearly. But just this being able to take up things rotate things, look at things in different directions, even if they're looking at it like this, um, feel the weight of objects, just touching things, feeling how many corners, the softness of objects or, or tissues or textures. There's so much richness in that information. Here's some examples, weight, number of corners, things that you learn and feel about objects when you start to interact with them by actually you know, touching them and moving them. Now, those are actually magnitudes. So not only should it allow kids to learn about objects, but it should, to some extent, focus their attention on magnitudes, train magnitude systems. Now, there are a few magnitude systems. So here is one, angles. And here's another one, I'm gonna come back to that in a while, called the approximate number system, which is another magnitude system. Why I found these to be fascinating, honestly, is that these, before I talk about them in detail, are considered in the field of development or infancy. They often talk about core knowledge principles, things that we have with us from birth, innate and unmodifiable by experience. <coughs> I don't think that's true. So let's look at this. This is an eye-tracking task where we put four of these up on an eye tracker. It, these tasks are so enormously boring, but that's the point. Okay. So when, when all, of the, all of these are different, but one is slightly more different, and they're slightly less boring. So if you only had two of these, it would be hopeless, because you wouldn't know which one they should look at. But when you have four, this one is the one that sticks out. And if they're able to see that, they tend to look here. So we have kids that have a random distribution of looking, and some kids that just zoom in on this one. The approximate number system, I'm gonna show in a movie, is something different. This is, to some extent, a innate ability that we all have. We have it together with bumblebees and, you know, fish, and anyone with a central nervous system is pretty good at this, basically. And the argument from evolutionary psychology is that 
you know, if you can't keep track of approximate numbers, you have no way of sort of knowing where to locomote towards or what you're supposed to run away from, where food is plentiful or nourishment or whatever you want to call it. That can be discussed, but that's how it's been uh, articulated. So the task is this. Again, this is not fun. But one of these sides is slightly less boring. It's this one. Do you all see it? The reason why this is slightly less boring is that there are slightly more things happening. So in this case, it's always the same number of dots changing. Here, at least, there is a change in number. And newborn chickens are really good at this. It can be seen as a system for numbers, that we can track approximate numbers. I think this means we can track approximate numbers, but to me, I don't think this is a system for that. I think it's a magnitude system, where this is a change in magnitudes that is larger across any domain. But that's just another interpretation of this. But in order to see sort of my logic, that to me, there is change in magnitudes here, and there are not changes in magnitudes over there, to the same degree. So if this is all connected, we, maybe we should be able to see, let me go back here, that kids that are good at reaching at an early age should develop a sensitivity to objects and shapes and forms, and that should facilitate this ability, usually seen as unchangeable uh, early in development. And this has several important implications. Yeah, so this is, I guess, is, is the same thing again. Because the approximate number system, we know that if you take a, a class of MIT super math people, uh, and you look at their math grades, some are good or some are worse, but they're all super good, and then you test this ability on them, you would see there is a strong correlation between those that are really good at math among the super math people. They have a more, better acuity of this approximate number system. And how we measure this is simply we, those people that do that with the, the adults, is that they make it harder and harder. So I think we all saw that there were more and less on one side. But if we change the distance in, in number between more and less, at some point we're just not going to see it anymore. It's like a teller cards of, of a magnitude system, right? So at some point it's just going to be random, you're going to look back and forth. So at that point, how, how acute is your system? How, how small changes can you detect? is something that can readily be measured. And that relates to math ability. It's also been shown that children, very young children, like two-year-olds, that have an, a good acuity of their uh, of number system, actually do better in formal math in school. So there is a clear continuation going from children up to experts in mathematics in this task. And what we can show in two different studies, this, this are, these are under review, so, uh, you know, you never know what happens, but this is, I think that this is really clear. Uh, what we can see is this. Kids at six months that are good at reaching, and we measure that by having an object move past them really quickly. And in order to catch it, you need to plan ahead. So it's all about planning again. You need to actually intersect that object, start to move your hand well before you can reach it, when it's out of reach, in order to successfully grasp it. And kids that can do that, they have well-developed motor abilities, and they're also very good at taking up objects, rotating them, feeling them, exploring their world. And this leads, a few months later, at 10 months, to a better ability to detect these angles, and to a better acuity of the approximate number system. We've also done training studies, and the correlation studies work beautifully, longitudinally, with 120 babies. The training studies we've done is that we've taken 10-month-olds, and we've given parents bl blocks and just say, play with your child. Go home, you know, put, bring up towers, knock them down, get the kids engaged in just feeling and touching and playing with the objects. And they do that for three weeks, and then before and after, they come to the lab, and we can see that compared to pre-test, those that have that active training become much better at perceiving these angles and shapes. So object perception is being enhanced by active exploration. We cannot in that study, because the, the study is, so it's pre-test at eight months, training, and then they come back at 12 months. We can see that effect. 
over that training period, we cannot, in that training study, see an effect on the approximate number system. So, five minutes. Okay. But at least for correlation, we see the full pattern, and for training studies, we see that clear first pattern, at least. So, I think there are, these are multiple ways to think about how action helps shape the mind. I was told that I have five minutes left, so this is really what, I, this is what we're working on mostly right now, so I'm going to do this quickly. Because if we're right, and I think this goes for many of the talks today, that if kids in general, or adults, we're, we're consuming a lot, of, a lot of information that needs to be stored and gathered somehow. And this is a challenge, of course, in order to really understand how this can be done. One approach to this is that when all the information that we gather, we're storing, but not as individual items, but rather as means and standard deviations, making an assumption that, the, that information is normally dis distributed. And this idea is very close to uh, Bayesian uh, inferential statistics and the idea of a Bayesian mind. So what we've done, this is our blip-blop study, uh, this is with Marcus and Per, who I've worked with, is that we present sounds. So I'm going away from actions and hands now, but just into an environment that is well controlled. And we present different sounds to adults or four-month-old babies. The four-month-old babies are sort of almost sleeping, the adults are sitting in darkness, just being really bored. And the study goes like this, blip, blop, 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 blip, blop, 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 blip, blop, blop. Okay. Nothing else happens. But the blips and the blops form this function. So it forms a normal distribution. And when we measure the adults, ERP component to this, and this is a classical mismatch negativity type of task, but instead of having categories, we present this distribution. We can see just shortly that the, the ERP components look like they should. But we can't really, with an ERP component, just say if they're able to keep track of this distribution or not. So given that there are 1,200 samples per participant, we calculate an ERP component to each individual trial, and the data looks like this. So, when we look at the deviation from the mean as a set value, we can see that the, the ERP response that we get out actually form a normal distribution, which matches the, the set value of the stimuli we're presenting. And if we take this and try to fit it to different functions, one is, just that there, one assumption would be that they just think about things as being in or outside, that they're forming categories. In that case, it would be what we refer to as a squared uh, function here, the red. And the other one is that they actually form, they have an assumption about a normal distribution, and they just place things with respect to that normal distribution over time. That's the blue. And we, this is fitting over time, and this is R square. So already after something like 50 trials, we have a very good explanatory value of a normal distribution. So we can actually see them in real time as they're taking in information and relating it to the other, all the other information in terms of the sad value of each individual item, which is sort of capturing the Bayesian mind in real time, if I'm going to be a bit sort of... Just since I know I'm out of time, the baby data four months olds look exactly the same. The only difference is that they have four blocks because they get more tired, so they need more breaks. Uh, but the, the data is identical, and we can see that both the adults and the babies keep track of all the information that they get in this short period of 20, 20 minutes. And think about every single item with respect to every other item, as if they were a Bayesian mind. Okay. And this is what I think is the way in which all the information from reaching and from looking and from all of the things that uh, feeds into developing cognition is being stored. And this is sort of where we want to look at this in the future to watch individual differences in this can actually account for cognitive growth and also how this function is actually being formed and if we can get adults and babies to build different types of distributions and react to different types of violations here. That's where I'm going to end. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Gustav. Any questions for Gustav? Not right now. You need to think about it a little more. Yes, just a second. I'll give you the microphone. Uh, actually, I won't give you the microphone. I'll catch the microphone to you. Ready? 
<laughs> oh, good there. And then you hold it up and you speak into the... Yeah, exactly. You're right. Um, the last thing you said was that um, every um, item in a Bayesian fashion uh, was related to every other item. Mm. And I, uh, I was a little confused by that because isn't every representation then, uh, in a sense, just uh, updating a distribution? So that, yeah. That, yeah, so that, yeah. I was, I was rather out of time there. So, but yes, so the idea, of course, in that sense, that every item is being part, in, is stored in that distribution that only requires a mean, a standard deviation, and an approximate number. And with those three factors, every, all the information is stored, but it's stored as a function uh, and being updated. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Oh. Yes, because he'd love to throw it. You can throw it to me. <laughs> yes, Thanks. there you go. Um, OK, then I have just one final question before we break for coffee. Um, I was curious, when you looked at the children, as you said, those that were good at prediction and good at su being surprised, they were also sort of good at, in a special setting, they would do actually exactly as they were told. They wouldn't put whatever it was in the bucket. They would give the toy to the adult mm. putting it in the bucket. Um, do you have any other indications on developmental differences between these two groups other than this one? Do you know what happens later in life? Is this a predictor for you know, anything bigger than this mm. particular setting? Yeah, so, so the, the, those that were good at this sort of internal model, build this hypothesis testing, were both good at executive control, which is a completely different set of studies, right. uh, where they don't take that literary wand, for example, and they were much right, okay, ab were so. able to find the objects in the, in the drawers that, that sort of requires working memory. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, it just does show just a very clear difference in how they interact with other people at two years of age. So I think the idea is that there is stability. This says something about future life. We don't yet know why, and it's hard to say that it's a better strategy, but clearly they're more, somehow more in tuned to people rather than instrumental helping. So when I do this, you know, you could help me in two different ways, but just really giving me something says something about us rather than solving the task. And this seems to be related to what, how they perceived the world already when they were six month olds. Mm -hmm. So there is continuity. That, that's what we can say so far. Right. So it says something about the relationship to people, sort of. Yeah. But we cannot know at this point if it says something about general success in life type of thing. That would, no. No, no. That, that would be that's like, next because, step. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Next year. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. We'll get back to that. Then. Yeah. Thank you very much. Gustav Jelebeck. <laughs>